trouble uh, with explaining uh, Bitcoin to uh, Muslims and Arabs, I think, um, because of this uh, deferral, deferring to authority. There's just this idea that, well, it, it doesn't matter what I think about it. There are experts who know those things. And if this is really the better money, you know, they'll uh, tell me. And until they do, um, you're just another weird guy on the internet with a crazy idea. I think you, you I mean, obviously, this, this, this is kind of the uh, default for the majority of people everywhere in the world. But I think in um, probably in Islamic uh, societies, it might be overrepresented compared to the West. And I think it's, um, it's, it, it's an impediment to the rise of Bitcoin. Uh, but of course, another big impediment other than just the banks and the governments, of course, are religious authorities. Now, interestingly here, religious authorities um, that are uh, in, in Islamic countries today will very rarely ever or will never, basically, the approved official religious authorities will never um, tell you that your national currency is riba, which is, I think, indisputable by Islamic standards. And know when whatever your currency is, it's created when your central bank uh, lends your government. It's created when the government issues treasury bonds. It's created when banks issue loans. So the money itself is riba. If you're holding the piece of paper, it's not like a piece of gold because it's not a commodity that is bought and sold on the market with its own value. It's a piece of paper that is somebody's um, somebody's debt, somebody made, got into riba debt in order for this to happen. So this, this I would think, uh, is a pretty significant detail. But of course, you know, uh, official religious authorities don't bring this up um, because, you know, they they are generally approved by the governments that benefit from these money printers. Yet somehow they find a lot of fault with Bitcoin. So a lot of religious scholars are constantly going on about why Bitcoin is bad and Bitcoin is wrong. What do you think of this debate? What do you think are the, um, what are the best arguments you've found for why Bitcoin is haram? And what are the best that you've found for why it's halal? And for those who don't understand the terminology, haram means that it is forbidden and halal means that it is uh, allowed. Okay, so from my position, um, first of all, yeah, it's interesting to see how people approach money first, how they approach fear to money first, and then how they approach Bitcoin. Because to me, the two are intricately linked. If you approach, if you understand fear to money and what it is and its impact, uh, its connection with riba. So you're right, in the UK, I mean, there's an organization called Positive Money, which I'm really supportive of. So it's not Muslims at all, but they're just after justice, right? And so they do very good information on uh, on the UK specifically. So they have they have data that says in the UK money supply, so only 3% of our money supply is physical, right? 80% is uh, bank credit creation, and 17% is central bank reserves. So 90, up to 97% is created through interest, through RIBA. And so, of course, all the money that I'm, you know, I, I, I get paid a salary. And when I spend in shops, it's all electronic. So everything I use is created by interest. And this is something I think Muslims don't, don't understand. And I think it's an understanding that's not encouraged as well. Because, again, as we said, when we go back to the source of authority, it's governments and, 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 and banking especially. So this is something that they could never really admit to, the connection between uh, money supply and, and, and interest. Uh, because I think once you do accept that, then... I think it's a very natural conversation to, to look at something like Bitcoin. But to the extent that you don't accept that, so that's not accepted. Then when you look at Bitcoin, I would say personally for me, so when I analyze Bitcoin from a religious point of view, this is just me as an individual. I don't give rulings, but I, I couldn't find anything problematic with it at all. Um, I do have a little bit of understanding of Islamic law. I, I do teach Islamic law at university, but it's a very superficial understanding. But personally for me, I, I didn't find a problem with it. The only thing on an individual level that I guess I, I regret, I, I understand, but I regret, I, I, I guess I dislike the, the aspect that the, the volatility in price can attract players who are not in it for the same reason. And, you know, just intellectually, I guess I just don't like that. It makes it, it makes it a bit seedy, right? But, uh, but I do understand the, the causes for that in terms of the, the state of um, the evolution of Bitcoin, and then with it, with this quick capital to be made, you get you get influx of certain uh, you know capital seekers and arbitrage and speculation. Um, so what I would say is that, especially for Muslims 
who are not very knowledgeable, like most people, when they see a chance to make a lot of money, I guess in any crypto they can, but in Bitcoin as well, um, I do regret that a lot of people are attracted to this to try to make money and a lot of people will, will lose money. So I would say that's one thing that I just wish was not there as part of the, the landscape with Bitcoin. In terms of how Muslims interact with it and scholars especially, so I, interesting, I do see some opinions recently either saying they're neutral about Bitcoin or one or two have actually said there's nothing haram about Bitcoin. They actually say it's okay. Um, so interestingly, how I see it dealt with, when I see pronouncements in general, whether uh, so governments don't make pronouncements, but, but uh, bodies of scholars. So when I see these pronouncements, often they don't talk about Bitcoin itself. They talk about crypto in general. And when you talk about crypto as a whole, you know, it's, it's a bit of a nonsense, right? And you're, you're grouping up every the next shit coin that's come out, ten thousand shit coins with, with Bitcoin, and they give a they give a uniform pronouncement, and it's and then it's difficult to uh, to attach too much value to it. Um, but I, because of the place that Bitcoin has, and the opposition it has to banking, and the place that Islamic banks have linked to governments and authority, I think we're in a in a in a very interesting place that I don't think we're going to get very clear answers because those who are providing opinions, if they're incentivized at all, they're generally incentivized by those who oppose, who oppose Bitcoin. Yeah, it's very true. And I think, um, you know, the, uh, the I, I think the argument that you make about the volatility is probably the kind of uh, the, the strongest one that they have against Bitcoin. Because if you look at, uh, if you look at how Bitcoin operates, I mean, yes, it's digital, but it functions, uh, but it operates no different from any kind of market commodity. Um, it gets mined, nobody can make it for free, nobody has the ability to produce it and foist it to the world uh, um, uh, for free. Everybody has to work for it. And the cost of producing it is roughly equal to the cost of it, the market uh, to its price on the market. Because it's a competitive production and there's a difficulty adjustment. And so um, it's just any, any other market commodity like all others. There's, uh, it, it's, incon it, it, it's inconceivable for me how you could find a religious objection um, to this. And then, uh, but then, you know, when you look at the volatility and you see that it does 20% in a day up or down, and then, you know, obviously that attracts a lot of speculation. It looks like uh, gambling. It looks like um, another Ponzi scheme and it looks like just another silly investment. And that I think, uh, and of course, you know, we've had a lot of crazy schemes over the past decades uh, of fiat. Um, everybody has a lesson, you know, their uncle and their grandfather told them about the one time where everybody thought they were going to get rich and then uh, didn't work out. So everybody's been burned by fiat adventures in the last century. So they're naturally going to be very skeptical. And when they see this volatility, it rings off uh, all the alarm bells. But... Um, uh, I think, you know, the, the volatility is, and the fact that there is speculation is true for many other commodities. You know, you, you know, if this was your criteria, then you would also say that gold is haram, um, wheat is haram, oil is haram. There are people who trade and make money and do leverage trading on all of these things. And uh, their price can be volatile. And that's the same the same case with Bitcoin. However, you know the deeper problem with all of this volatility and the deeper and the markets and the reason people are, you know, the reason so many people are able to not have real jobs and instead uh, just spend their day um, gambling on movements in the price of oil or gold or Bitcoin or anything is the fact that we don't have a sound monetary system. And so everything is up in the air. Money's being printed all the time and money's circulating in the, um, uh, across different sectors and different ways. And so therefore you get these massive bubbles and these massive crashes. And uh, work becomes an insignificant detail compared to being able to speculate correctly. So this is really a symptom of a fiat, which Bitcoin fixes. If you did have a monetary system built around Bitcoin, it would be similar to gold. And there was a lot less... Um, empty speculation on the gold and there was a lot more um, conscious investing. Um, 